Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're well. Beautiful sunny day here. Look at this. Uh, right, this video here is about this uh, Tesla Model S. You would have seen this in a recent video, actually. We've had this car in the company for a couple of years now and covered very nearly 40,000 miles in this car. Uh, so as this now is eight years old and has over 100,000 miles in total, I was just going to give a bit of a run through, really. I can talk to you about what we've spent on the car, uh, what maintenance, what repairs this car has needed, any warranty work it's had, and just have a bit of a look through it and go through what an older, nearly eight-year-old Tesla Model Model S is like. It's coming out of warranty soon, so are we concerned about it? Do we need to kind of get rid of it, or do we think it's going to be okay? In this video, I'm going to tell you. Okay, so it's a 2014 car. This is very nearly eight years old and has currently got 103,000 miles on the clock here. Being an earlier car, as we mentioned in that other video, it has free supercharging like the older cars do, and it's retained that. And we've made good use of that. Like I say, in the last two years, we've covered 40 odd thousand miles in this, uh, up and down the country collecting cars, and it's still in daily use. Um, so it's been good with that regards, absolutely. It's one of the first cars in the country. And what I want to cover first, I think, is the battery. You know, so when Tesla's, uh, when this was new, the warranty on the drivetrain, the motors, and the battery was eight years unlimited mileage. And there's certainly higher mileage cars out there. I've, we see this commonly now of well over 100,000 miles. I know there's some in the UK with kind of 300,000 miles. There's a chap in Germany with over a million miles on his car. Anyway, but about this one here, um, yes, one of the early cars in the country. And what do we think now that the battery warranty will run out in a few weeks' time? You know, uh, and I want to cover this first because it's one of the co most common uh, points of discussion with older Teslas. You know, will the battery just stop working and there'll be huge repair bills? Well, the cost of replacement battery, we don't really know yet, but my thoughts on this are basically that I don't expect the battery to have an issue. It's still currently absolutely fine. We could be unlucky, but I think I'd be more nervous about the engine in the car. You know, over 100,000 miles, uh, eight years old. I think the engine's a more risky thing uh, than a battery failure. But let's say one day it does fail. There will be people that can repair them, change modules, uh, obviously test them themselves, could probably the more expensive option. But as things come out of warranty, there are specialists there ready to learn how to fix stuff and repair them at much cheaper cost. So for me, I'm more than happy to take that on the chin. Uh, I think warranty companies now are offering uh, various extended warranty packages for Teslas. I'm not too worried about that. I don't tend to buy the extended warranty for my fridge. It is what it is and hopefully it's okay. And that's just the way I am. So. Personally, I'm not worried about the batteries in this. We have seen plenty of EVs now come out of their warranty periods and, um, and even older than this car, and their batteries have basically been fine. They might not be quite as fresh as they were when they were new, maybe not quite the same capacity, and I'll come on to real world current mileage on this at the moment in a, in a little bit. Um, but that hasn't affected use values. I think what we've seen now that EVs have been around us a few years is that generally they're exceptionally reliable and we don't expect the battery on this to die. I think that's going to be uh, extremely unlucky if it did, certainly not for a very long time. And let's say in another 10 years it has degraded to the point where we'd want to change or we did have an issue. There'll be batteries on the market available, reconditioned one, ones out of uh, crash cars, just like there are with engines on cars today. So I'm going to get that bit out of the way. That's my thought on the battery and the battery warranty situation when it runs out. I think it's going to be absolutely fine. Maybe proven wrong, but generally they've been good so far. And this is still on its original battery. So as far as I'm aware, we haven't done any paint work. This car's had no paint work from new. It's certainly not had any major accidents. There's a little bit of, uh, should we call it patina on here, Serge? A little, was this us or was that where when we got it? Yeah, since we got it. So it's been there since we got it. A little graze in the corner there. Obviously that's not the car's fault. Uh, but the paint itself, yes, it's black. Uh, no PPF on this car. Uh, it has had a ceramic coat for the last couple of years. I think when we got it, it had ceramic coat, um, which has lasted well. It's due a bit of love and attention, a bit of polishing again soon, like we, we do with a black car usually most years. But this one has been a little bit unloved. It's a bit of a workhorse in the company. So yeah, there's a few little stone chips around, but it's been okay. There's a little bit of light scratching around hand and stuff. But as you can see, hopefully, it polishes up well, the paint works still good. We certainly had no issues with any uh, corrosion or oxidization or any bubbling of the paint. Remember, it's aluminium, this car, the Tesla Model S. Uh, and sometimes I've seen cars where they've had a stone chip or scratch and that can oxidize the aluminium and you'll get paint bubbling. Uh, but without broken paint, shouldn't be a problem. And this one actually cleans up and always looks pretty good each time. So I'm really pleased with that. Uh, I'll come on to the interior in a minute. The wheels now, you see here, we, we do switch between wheels. If we've got long journeys to do, especially in the winter, we might go to 19 inch wheels, but nearly always we've got these 21 inch turbine wheels on here. Um, they've lasted well. I'll come on to tire wear in just a second. 
Uh, but we find that although this does affect the range, we do like the look of it with these wheels on. It still drives nicely. The S 19 inch wheels are a bit more efficient uh, and a little bit of a better ride comfort, but these are okay. This one does have air suspension, um, but we've had no issues with that at all, touch wood so far. That's been absolutely fine. And as you can see, yeah, it looks well. It looks, cleans up nicely, it looks good. Let's have a quick look at the interior and then I'll get onto some of the maintenance and repairs that have been carried out in this car. So you'll see this has got the first gen seats as a known. So later on in late 2015, we saw what they called next gen seats and they had bigger side bolsters. These are the earlier seats with less bolstering and they're flatter. Uh, but I think because they don't have such big bolsters, they've lasted pretty well. These are one of the days when we had leather. So this is a leather seat and you can see that it has squashed down a little bit here on this side with a bit of kind of crease in there, but none of the stitching's come apart. We do sometimes see a bit of wear on this edge here, but this is all pretty good. Mixed opinions about the seats. I actually like these flatter first gen seats. I can kind of fidget around them and move more, change my position. So I like them, they're fine. Uh, some people do prefer the later next gen seats with the bigger bolsters. They sort of hug you a little bit more, a bit more support there. Uh, but generally, you know, it's over 100,000 miles and a little bit creasing on the seat. I'm happy with that. This is a common point of wear that we see. So you can see in the corner here, this uh, pillar, as you get in now, it's easy to brush this corner. And so this has suffered that. We've got a little bit of wear on that. And because this is a lighter headliner, it's got a little bit grubby here. We need to give this a clean. Very commonly, we see that this seal here gets kind of pushed back, but I always just kind of tend to put it back like that. Uh, but yeah, nothing too bad, and we can do little repairs on this, and you can actually buy these whole uh, pillar trims and just replace them if you want to. Uh, Serge has put a, a steel wheel cover on this car to protect the original wheel, but there were no issues before. Um, it looks pretty good. I'm not a huge fan of steel wheel covers, but Serge likes it. <laughs> Watch this video and go, what did you just say? Uh, but in here, the switch gear and everything has lasted well. All the sort of electric window buttons, this is all Mercedes parts bin stuff. So durable, no scratching, no wear, no things have come off there. It still drives well and has no squeaks or rattles in the cabin, you know. It's actually still a very nice car to be in and to drive in. Uh, let's have a quick check of the back seats, see how they're faring. Uh, back seats here also don't get used as much. We don't really use as a taxi, there's not really anybody in the back very often. So. To be honest, the back seats are like new. Um, yeah, it's okay being in the back of a Model S. You've got plenty of leg room and knee room. The headroom's a little bit tight. You see here, I'm kind of on the top of the, the roof there, but I've been okay in the back of this for a long time. The uh, floor is nice and flat and you've got space under here to stretch out a little bit. Uh, one thing I have always said about the Model S is that the seat's a bit low to the floor, so you do end up with your knees up a little bit. Uh, but, you know, they're spacious cars and if you've got things like kids and baby seats in they're good fold the seats down and there's plenty of space in there there's no central armrest in these and there are a few model s's around with what they call executive rear seats so you've only got two seats and uh, not, not one in the middle here um, if you see one of them around they're very rare and one thing you do need to remember is that the back seats then don't fold like all the other ones do and there are some around with seats in the boot so there are some seven seat model s's out there are those seats in the boot, rear face and child seats that fold out the floor. You can't add them afterwards, they have to be factory specified and actually the, the rear crash structure is slightly different on those cars, very stiff. What I would say is if you're thinking, well, I've got a couple of teenage kids, they can go in the back there, probably not. Those back seats really are for pre-teenagers um, because you don't have too much room. You're facing backwards, your head's here, your face is in the sun from the back window. I don't think it'd be too long before you could get uh, a bit queasy. And I have had seven seat Model S's before where the boot does smell a bit sicky. Parcel shelf boot areas all lasted absolutely fine. It's a really nice big boot on the Model S actually. And when we did a practicality test recently between the SX and the Y and the 3, the, the S is the one actually it's the widest. You can get wider loads in here and, and it's big enough to usually get a mountain bike without even taking the wheels off. If you fold the seats, it's just got that width there which makes it really practical. Uh, we've got that kind of boxed in section here because this has the high fidelity sound upgrade. You know that because it's got the box there. If it doesn't have that, it's just a hollow drop like on the other side there. And then of course you've got big storage under the floor here which is dead handy for cables, dirty wellies, all that kind of thing. This has got premium interior package. So it includes the power tailgate, 
and we've had no issues with that at all. One thing we do have is a few of the pixels on this third brake light have failed. We're starting to see that a little bit more and more. You need 50% of these pixels to be working to pass an MOT, uh, but that is starting to become a uh, common point with these. Not easy to change either. I think you do have to take out the rear glass to change that. So yeah, you need to keep an eye on that for some of the early Teslas and uh, some of the early ones as well. You often see spiders and flies have got in the back lights, but we've kept ours nice and clean there, as you can see. Uh, this has got a, a D-chrome, by the way, so hence this is black, that's black, and the trims around here are black instead of chrome. That's purely because we've had them, uh, or we wrapped them, and uh, this back section here actually gets painted, uh, but that's why they're black and not chrome, just because of us. Being a rear wheel drive early car, we've got this huge front space, including all that space in there, which is brilliant. You can even get push chairs through this gap here, or you can use a snazzy Tesla bag here like Serge has. So tons of space in these, they're brilliant. Um, if you've got a dual motor car, even an early one, it will have less space because there's another motor instead of this. Uh, sitting in there and then all the facelift cars have got the smaller frunk here because they've got the bigger pollen filters and such like but this is dead handy to have that practicality with that huge frunk space. Did you spot earlier on the interior that we've got this uh, center console section here normally this is an open floor but we've just got this insert in here which I don't know if I think it kind of wedges in but normally this would be open kind of yacht floor but it's easy to get these center consoles so you do have a bit more storage in here and in here um, I actually like it as the open space. You've got like a lunch bag or something straight down on there, handbag straight down on there. Um, so it's useful for my handbag, obviously. And, um, but it's yeah, very easy to get these consoles and that's what uh, we've added on this one here. So one of the great things about a Tesla is how the software always updates. You know, so this will always have updates like a phone or an iPad and have new features and functions. And so it's very relevant today. What we have done with this car, and we've made another video specifically about this, is upgrade the processor and the screen here. So we had what's called the MCU2 upgrade. Uh, so this is all now lightning fast. If I just come back to the map in here, you'll see that we can move this mapping around. It's responsive, fast, very clear. And uh, it means we've also got the latest functions of having um, all the games and also Netflix and YouTube and stuff like that. It's not usually essential uh, to have, well, it's not essential to have the MC2 upgrade. The earlier ones did suffer what's called the EMMC failure, but Tesla extended the warranty that to 100,000 miles. Um, and so that did affect quite a lot of Model S's, but by warranty, they were changed. If you have or had the MCU2 upgrade, that negates it anyway. On this car here, it was actually this screen and this screen that were both upgraded at a cost of, I want to say 1,400 pounds. If that's not correct, I'll correct it down here, but £1,400. Um, but this just brings it back up to date with you know, super, super quick lightning responses on the screen, quicker route planning, navigation, loading and stuff like that. So you know, this is all very much like one of the last Model S's that we could get in the UK. So this car is a pre-autopilot car. It doesn't have the camera system or the radar, so it can't have autopilot. So that's why this display here looks different. If you get a car from late 2014 onwards, you'll have a different visual here because it's got the graphics and the layout ready for autopilot and lane assist functions and such like. Uh, but I really like using this. I love this old display where it shows your power and your speed on this central uh, round display here. So I actually really like this. It's cool. Looks like I've picked up just a little bit of kind of damage on this sort of soft aluminium frame to the screen here, but nothing too major to complain about. So we've had this car since 2020, and uh, so I'm going to run through the maintenance that we've done on this car since then. Uh, I can't really count for the maintenance before that, obviously it's before we had it the first six years, uh, but from what we could ascertain, uh, everything was original. The motor and battery were all original stuff, and uh, it hadn't had any major work. Uh, but since then, we've done a few things. Uh, let's start off with tyres. How, how much do we get out of a set of tyres? Let's have a look. So let's cover the tyres and how often they were changed. So in 2021, in March, we did a, a full set of tyres and the wheel alignment that cost just over £1,000. £1,021, I should say. Let's be specific here. Uh, what we found is that from the front tyres, and we've always been running these 21-inch Continental TO tyres, so the Tesla tyres. You can put other brands on, and I don't think they really have to be TO or with the foam, but that's what we've used. Uh, these tyres here are normally about £200 plus the VAT, £240 each. Um, so they're not particularly cheap, but there are more expensive out there. Front tyres, 27,000 miles to a set of those. 
The rear tyres, however, we've been getting at 17,000 miles. So obviously rear wheel drives, so it's putting all that torque down on the rear tyres there. They don't last as long. And because they're staggered tyres, different size front to back, we can't tyre rotate them. Um, there are some where you've got the same on the front and back, but usually they're staggered, they're slightly wider on the rear. So 27,000 miles, 17,000 miles to a set of tyres, about 200 pounds plus VAT per tyre. At 78,000 miles, we had to replace one of the TPMS sensors. So that's the sensor uh, pack of this valve, which monitors the tyre pressures. And that was 70 pounds. At 76,600 miles, the rear motor was replacing its car. So the earlier S85s usually have had the rear motor replaced. It was a common issue where you just kind of get a little bit of excessive whining. Still work, then like stop working, but you'd get some excessive whining normally. Usually in the early days and Tesla would uh, just change that under warranty. And indeed that's what they did with this one. So as most people now know that the electric cars don't use their brakes very often. The motor slows the car down. You can kind of one pedal drive. So actually using the friction brakes is quite rare. And that's why this car is still on its original brake discs and pads. They've never been changed. Now it's very rare to need changing. And um, the only time we have seen them needed is actually where people just don't use them enough. So we always try and sort of stress the buyers that every now and then you should just kind of make a point of using the brakes. When you come off a motorway and there's nobody behind you, just kind of brake a little bit, get it moving because you don't want your caliper to seize up. If that does seize up, you can end up warping your, your disc, for example, and obviously wearing your brake pads down. Now, Tesla can obviously replace brake pads and discs, but these are available aftermarket. If you want to change a set of front discs and pads, it's going to cost you just over 200 pounds plus the VAT to buy a set of them aftermarket and then plus fitting, but fitting them is easy, same as any other car. We did spend 280 pounds on this, which is called a CCS adapter. And I do recommend this for any Model S and X owner, basically. The Model S and X has got this small Type 2 port here, which takes DC charging as well. That's the supercharger plug into these. Uh, but all the newer superchargers and all the uh, main third-party chargers now, really a CCS connection. You could get a Chadamo adapter, but really the way to go now is CCS. This was £280 when we bought it some time ago. They're £200, including VAT now, from Tesla. You can't just buy these off eBay, by the way. Tesla do have to program the car to know that it's got a CCS adapter. And that will then show more of the Tesla supercharger network because a lot of the, well, nearly all the new sites now are CCS connections only. So if you haven't got that adapter, you simply can't use them. At 90,600 miles, we changed the 12 volt battery. Uh, it's a 12 volt battery. It has a 12 volt battery like any other car. Um, so you would normally get a warning message if the 12 volt battery is detected as getting low. And uh, you can still use the car, it's fine. It would usually stop any software updates happening. And what you don't wanna do is park the car on a low state of charge. But you've normally got quite some time to get a new battery uh, for your car. So no immediate rush with that. It doesn't like, it's not like it doesn't start unless you leave it for ages and let it drain right down. So a new 12 volt battery was a grand total of 145 pounds. Suspension, bits wear on suspension, right? Yeah, well I said the air suspension's been fine so far, touch wood no dropping, no sagging there, uh, but the drop link, so uh, quite a simple little piece. We had one drop link that started making a little bit of noise. We actually changed all four drop links in the end, uh, and that came to a total of 204 pounds plus 100 pounds fitting, and we just had it fitted at a local garage, which you can probably hear just over there. This was chrome, but we wanted a black one, so we actually bought a black one from Tesla for this, 80 pounds. On the facelift cars, the DRL lights along here very commonly fail. Uh, if you buy a new headlight from Tesla, it's 1,500 odd pounds for one of them. But on the earlier cars like this, uh, they don't. It's very rare to see an issue with these, and indeed these are the original headlights and working fine. Uh, they're Xenon rather than LED, so they're not right up there with the latest uh, and greatest headlight technology, but they do a good job and we've never had to replace them or do anything with them. Long-term efficiency of this car, well, in the last trip set for the, when we replaced the rear tyre, so just under 10,000 miles, We've averaged 361 watt hours per mile. So uh, yeah, not as efficient as our Model 3 long range, but this is everything. So that includes winter, that includes motorway trips, as well as just a daily commute in cold weather to and from work. Uh, so it's, it's reasonable and still puts to shame a lot of the newer electric cars out there. What do we get for real world range on this car then? So we did a recent video of this and a 70D um, uh, just last week and fairly nice warm weather like this. With the 19 inch wheels on, we could still get 
nearly 250 miles out of this, so we think that's very good. It hasn't suffered too much battery degradation at all. Uh, maybe when it was new, maybe you could have eaten 260, maybe 270 out of it, but it hasn't really lost too much. We normally run with these 21 inch wheels and tires, as you've seen, and with that, we tend to get about 225 miles of range. In winter, we do see that come down to nearer 200 miles of range. Uh, obviously, the temperature does make quite a big difference on how hard the heating is working. Uh, this would be obviously a pre-heat pump car, so the winter has a bit of an effect on this, but still 200 miles of usable range every day. The charging, well, the charging speed is one of the things that affects uh, the older batteries. Tesla actually uh, did a software update and they actually, they actually slowed the charging speed down at supercharger, so they don't charge at quite the, the rate that they used to. If it's at a very low state of charge, warm battery, it still pulls over 100 kilowatt charging speed, uh, but it does quite quickly ramp down to usually about 50 kilowatts uh, by the time you get in the mid-range. So it takes a little bit longer than a newer Model 3 or Model Y or the newer S's and the long ranges, uh, but it's, you know, an extra 10 minutes of the charger. So, you know, have a second coffee perhaps or answer two more emails. So uh, still very usable as we've shown on that video the other day for doing long daily journeys. Uh, no problem at all. What's it like to drive still? Uh, well, I did mention, it, you know, it still drives absolutely fine. I like the rear wheel drive. It's a lighter front end. I still enjoy the rear wheel drive cars for their balance. Uh, the interior is absolutely fine, no squeaks, rattles, still feels solid, air suspension smooth. This has got that high fidelity sound system, which still is one of the best sound systems of any car I've been in. So I think that's epic and brilliant. And of course, the software here with especially the upgraded MCU2 all works absolutely fine, no problem. We've only got basic cruise control, no autopilot, remember, so uh, depends on, you know, if you like to have autopilot for some very long journeys, but this is fine, cruise control on nice car to drive, still fantastic. One thing that works really well for us with this car is it has what's called dual chargers enabled and that enables uh, full use of a uh, three phase power supply and it can charge at 22 kilowatts. So latest Tesla Model Y can only charge at 11 kilowatts. Uh, the last of the Model S's I think were also 11 kilowatts and you have to have that dual charger thing enabled but this one had it when we got it. And that means that that speed, it charges over 60 miles per hour. And so if like now this car has been out during the day today, comes back, we can go from 30% to 90% state of charge, which is what we normally put up to 90% uh, in under two hours. So being able to make use of the three phase electric we have here at our uh, warehouse and offices to charge us super fast is really handy. That charging speed is only seen, I think, by the Renault Zoe, uh, but it means we can just top this up really fast here, ready for another trip. And that works brilliantly for us. So what does it cost for running? How much should we spend on electric for this car? Uh, so uh, obviously a proportion of the um, distance we've covered has been using the supercharging. And um, that's obviously free on the car of this vintage. So that's been a free element there. Uh, and then I'm basing the, about the 40,000 miles we've done. I think about 28,000 miles, roughly speaking, has been with uh, charging mainly at the office here or at home. So with the rate we pay here, business electricity, uh, I've worked out, roughly speaking, again, there's going to be some give and take here, but roughly speaking, it's probably cost me about £1,500, £1,500 on our electric bill for charging this car uh, for the last nearly 40,000 miles. So I think that's uh, pretty reasonable. Let's say the, what we've charged here is at the new rates. Let's say we take 28 pence, so this has gone up recently, but let's say it was all at 28 pence per kilowatt hour. We'd, be spent, we'd have spent maybe two and a half, 2,600 pounds, roughly speaking, on uh, the electric based on just the current rates going back a couple of years. Um, so still pretty reasonable. By some very quick calculations, take a 40-ish miles per gallon car, um, divide that by uh, the fuel cost, let's, let's say £1.75 because it's about £2 a litre now, but it was cheaper before. Uh, that would still work out to I think over £8,000 roughly speaking, so it certainly brought about a fuel saving. Uh, then we've had no servicing costs other than the maintenance I've described, the tyres and the wipers, you'd have that on any car, uh, zero road tax. Uh, and obviously there's benefit and kind taxation to run this as a company car has been either nothing or in the last uh, year next to nothing anyway. So it's been a very cheap car to run. Uh, residuals, well, um, I bought this car a couple of years ago for under £30,000. I bought it from a lease company, it was well under £30,000 then. Um, today, in the current market, 
this car's worth probably about £32,000. So it's actually gone up in value after the last two years and even added 40,000 miles on it. So that is pretty cheap motoring. If you balance all that out, we're pretty much cost neutral. It's not too far of costing nothing to run this car for the last couple of years. And therefore, I'm happy to carry on running it for the foreseeable future. It's not for sale, so I don't message. Um, but it's been a fantastic car and we still love it and use it every day. So that's our experience with an eight-year-old Tesla Model S. If you've got an older Tesla Model S, do comment below. I want to know, you know how much you reckon you've probably saved in fuel costs, what you think of it. If you did have problems, let us know about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd be interested to read all those comments and how many miles. If you've got a high mileage one, get that below. And if you happen to live in the south of England, you've got a very high mileage one, and I want to see over a quarter of a million miles in a the car, then let us know as well. It'd be good if you come and show it to us and we can perhaps do another video on that car. Uh, but for us, for now, that's it on this one. This is our Batmobile, BA Double T, and it's been fantastic. We're going to keep it, and we'll see you on the next video.